Saltsjöbaden is a sailing mecca, not far from Stockholm, the capital of Sweden. The sea and the wind are always very present here. This is where this year's laureate grew up and where he still lives. In fact, he also started his scientific career here, at the old observatory on the hill behind me. Right, this was just for a few months, I was an astronomer. <laughs> then I moved on to back to Earth and, and the rest of my career has been as an atmospheric scientist. His scientific career has taken him to places all over the world, but Stockholm University has been the basis of Henning Rode's research. Henning is not the, the person that you would notice the first when you get into the room. He doesn't take a lot of space. But after a meeting, you may remember what he actually said. As I said, it contains sulfate. It contains it's a great fortune to have Henning as a mentor and a uh, colleague. He's always been supporting many generations of scientists throughout the world. Henning Rode is a low-key scientist, not too fond of the limelight. But his scientific career is deeply connected to some of the most dramatic events of the modern environmental debate. He was one of the first scientists in the 1970s to launch a new theory, that emissions from coal-fired power plants in Great Britain was playing a key role in acidification of lakes and forests in Sweden and Norway. At first, he was dismissed. There was a lot of skepticism, even among the scientists, and in particular among organizations like Central Electricity Generating Board in England, who were responsible for much of the emissions. At that time, in the 50s and 60s, people thought that air pollution is a local phenomenon, basically. Pollutants don't travel more than tens of kilometers, something like that. But in the late 1960s, we realized that it was pollution traveling from England, UK, and the continent that affected Swedish and Norwegian rivers, making them more acid. It was through studies of our sjöar that forskarna first slog larm om försurningen. A stickprov visade att av 150 sjöar så var så gott som samtliga i ett bedrövligt tillstånd. And uh, that's where I started my PhD work, trying to quantify this long-range transport over thousands of kilometers. Later, other scientists confirmed the results. Policy and regulations were changed and emissions cut. In Gårdsjön, in western Sweden, scientists even built a roof over a forest area in order to see what happened when it was protected from acid deposition. The research showed that as soon as emissions stopped, normal and healthy conditions returned quite rapidly. We have seen enormous improvements, that's for sure. I mean, the sulfur emissions in Europe and North America have gone down by 70-80% in the last 30 years or so. And that's a remarkable achievement, I think. The Chernobyl nuclear accident in 1986 was another example of long-range transportation of particles, leading to radioactive fallout thousands of kilometers away. We were very unfortunate here in, in, in Sweden that the plume from Chernobyl, from the accident, it was traveling with the winds right in this direction. And on the way via Belarusia, over the Baltic and up to Sweden, it wasn't diluted and it wasn't not much deposited on the ground. So it, the cloud came here very much still concentrated. And what happened when the cloud entered this region, it found itself in a frontal rain system. And a lot of the radioactive material was washed out by rain. So the cesium concentrations in the ground became very high in some parts of northern central Sweden. Årets älgjakt sker i skuggan av Tjernobyl. Oväntat höga halter radioaktivt cesium har uppmätts i älgkroppar i södra Västerbotten. Där man grävt en särskild grop för de radioaktiva djurkropparna. In the 1990s, Henning Rode was a leading author in reports from the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. The important thing that he does is to connect policy and basic science. 
to bring the science into policy. Henning Rode's research can be described to some extent as detective work, combining data collection with scientific theories and fieldwork. During recent years, he's been much involved in the research on ABC, atmospheric brown clouds. Atmospheric brown clouds start on the ground. They're a byproduct of road traffic, slash and burn, coal fired power plants, and as here, cooking on firewood or dung. Atmospheric brown clouds is something you can actually see from space, from satellites, and also from airplanes when you're up flying. And it's this haze that is forming over huge areas, many places on Earth actually, but the, the largest concentrations are over the Indo Gangetic Plain, Pakistan, northern India, Bangladesh and also over China. And it's uh, particularly in the dry winter season. And the problem with these clouds, this pollution, is both that it affects climate, the monsoons even, and also that it affects people's health. Air pollution index has reached well above 300. Now 300 being of a dangerous level. Atmospheric brown clouds are most pronounced here in Asia, where they can dramatically, like a day-to-day, -day, reduce sunlight. Their toxic mix of soot and other particles penetrates the lungs, and it's estimated that at least one million people die every year because of this, perhaps more. These particles, they're so small, they actually enter not only into the lungs and have effects, but also enter into the bloodstream. And small soot particles in all organs on human bodies, also in the brain. A large international campaign called Indoex, Indian Ocean Experiment, started in the 90s. That was the first time that one realized that urban-like air pollution was not limited to, to urban environments, large cities, but actually covered large areas of the land and ocean in South Asia. To study this, the scientists found the perfect place. It is a very strategic location where it has been placed in collaboration between the International Science Team and the Maldives government. And that is in the northernmost atoll of the Maldives, the northernmost island, and the northern tip of this island. So that it sits there and receives uh, a very large footprint, the, the, the brown cloud oozing out from, uh, from South Asia. And we can study then the effects and the sources of these brown cloud components. And Henning was instrumental in making that happen, both in the international deliberations on where to place it, but also in ensuring that there was uh, funding available to actually construct it and operate it. And it has been a success story. Scientific research was instrumental in the process that led to emissions cut in Europe and North America. Now there are hopes that research on ABC will lead to the same type of emission reductions. But what about the future? I have to say that my dream is that uh, we will see a real reduction in the emission of carbon dioxide. That would be the success story. He's a very keen bird watcher and uh, actually as a former PhD student of him he forced all the PhD students to go bird watching and answer bird questions and I failed. <laughs> he likes to sing. He's, so, he's offering to sing himself, it is nice. And also he calls on people, normally one person from each country, to stand up and uh, sing a tune in their native language. So that shows another aspect of the wonderful personality that is, is Henning Rodin.